Tom Brady is close to joining another NFL team. It's Monday, May 15th. I'm senior writer Owen Boindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Tom Brady is in talks to buy a stake in the Las Vegas Raiders, according to the Wall Street Journal. Brady already owns a stake in the Las Vegas Aces, who, like the Raiders, are owned by Mark Davis. We'll probably know more about this soon. For now, I have questions. One, does this impact his broadcasting deal with Fox? As you'll recall, Brady, who has never called a game before, signed a 10-year, $375 million deal with Fox to be their lead analyst. That's more than he made in salary for his entire playing career. I don't know of a situation in which a broadcaster also owned a piece of a team. It's not ideal for conflict of interest reasons, but I also doubt anyone who will actually care enough to try and throw a wrench in things. I'm guessing the league is very happy to have him in the broadcast booth and will also be happy to have him as an owner. Fox has said they are okay with this, according to ESPN. All that said, Andrew Barshand wrote a column for the New York Post earlier this month saying that he's talked to people close to Brady And he's saying there is a 51% chance that he backs out of his Fox deal. I'd be surprised, but we shall see. Question two, does he want to shape the future of this franchise or just be part of the club? Teams typically have at least a few owners who like being part of that exclusive group. They like how that team stake basically only goes up in value. And they probably like it for tax purposes too, but they don't feel the need to weigh in on personnel moves. Then there are owners like Derek Jeter in a stint with the Miami Marlins, who own a minority stake, but have a guiding role in the franchise. Those are very different paths. One is fairly anonymous. The other is the next big piece of Brady's legacy. For now, the reporting is that he would be a passive owner, which keeps him in line with conflict of interest rules, not because of how he would call games, but because he would have a stake in media rights negotiations. And if he's an active owner, then that puts him on both sides of the negotiating table. For now, he's staying passive but it puts him a small step away from team management if at some point he decides he wants the more active role. And question three, is there any chance this would lead to Brady getting back on the field? He was reportedly in talks with the Miami Dolphins at some point about being a player owner, which led to the Dolphins getting fined for tampering because he was still under contract with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's 45, he has to quit at some point, but for me, he has to go a full year without playing for me to believe he's totally done. Looking elsewhere, last year in a Major League Soccer game between the Colorado Rapids and Los Angeles Galaxy, Rapids player Max Alvis substituted in in the 63rd minute. He committed a penalty and received a yellow card two minutes later. Now, allegations are coming out that he did that on purpose because he was paid $12,000 by gamblers to take a penalty and maybe not just in that one instance. Alvis has been suspended while MLS looks into this. Alvis was playing in Brazil before coming to the Rapids, and he is the one player outside of Brazil so far implicated in investigations by the state of Goiás, which accuses 16 people of manipulating results of 13 games this year and last year. Brazil launched its own investigation into all of this last week. And all that comes on the heels of Alejandro Bersaco receiving his sentence on Friday for charges around bribing soccer officials. Bersacco pled guilty and cooperated with prosecutors, and he got off with time served. But it came as a handy reminder of what he alleged, which includes the following. He bribed people at FIFA for marketing rights to the World Cup, Copa America, and other tournaments. He bribed the head of Conmebol, who was arrested in 2015 on corruption charges. Conmebol is essentially the FIFA of South America. He also said that Qatar bribed FIFA to become the host of the 2022 World Cup. He's far from the only person saying that. He also testified at the trial of former 21st century Fox executives Hernan Lopez and Carlos Martinez, who are accused of handing out bribes in exchange for broadcasting rights. Lopez was convicted, but Martinez was acquitted. Soccer has a corruption problem. Some of the worst actors have been weeded out, but clearly they weren't the only ones. Step one to dealing with it is for FIFA to throw its weight behind fixing it, starting with itself. I'm not holding my breath on that one. Up next, I spoke to CBSSports.com writer Barrett Salee. We discussed the Deion Sanders phenomenon, the impact he's having at Colorado, the massive roster turnover he's overseen there, and what effect that could have on the college football landscape. We'll have that conversation right after this.
Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash front office. That's netsuite.com slash front office. All right, there is a ton happening in the world of college sports here to help us understand is Barrett Salee, CBSSports.com writer, analyst at CBS Sports HQ and Sirius XM host. Welcome, Barrett. Thanks for having me. Yeah, lots going on in, uh, in our world of college sports, even though it isn't football season. So lots to talk about, though. Let's start with Deion Sanders in Colorado. Um, I, I want to start at the very beginning, just for people who are still kind of like, probably know that he's coaching Colorado, but don't really know why everyone's talking about it. So to start, why was it a big deal when Deion Sanders signed on to coach Colorado, who finished 1-11 last year? I think certainly star power was the biggest reason. You know, you look at, at Deion Sanders and you immediately think, oh, primetime, the guy who played both basketball, uh, football and baseball on the same day, the guy who high stepped his way into the end zone and all that stuff. He, he is such a a big personality that I think, you know, that sort of jumps off the page. And then you look and see what his coaching career, you know, has been, you know, at Jackson State for a couple years, he turned that program into an FCS monster. He had the camps back in the day, the Deion Sanders school. He was actually pursuing some other jobs when they were open, like his alma mater, Florida State, Arkansas, before they hired Sam Pittman. So I think all of that combined, uh, kind of, you kind of look at it and you're like, oh, that's different. That's very different, but there's a lot to be excited about. So my first reaction when it, when it was Colorado was, okay, yeah, Dion was going to get hired somewhere after his success at Jackson State. Why Colorado? And, and it jumps to, okay, Pac-12, it's going to be easier in terms of making the playoff once USC and UCLA leave. And he's, he's going to have players gravitate towards him. So I get it. And if Colorado wants to be unique, that's a way to do it. And if they want visibility, that's a way to do it. So I'm, I'm okay with it. I, and, I, and I thought that at the time, Colorado did a great job trying to figure out what its identity is going to be moving forward. And we'll see if it actually works. It's a high risk, high reward situation. But if you're Colorado, you take that risk to, uh, to potentially get that reward and become you know, a team that is a, is a football power like it was back in the early 90s. Yeah, and I mentioned they they weren't so hot last year, but w- what's the risk for them, um, you know, given that they're coming off a pretty lousy season? There's not much. You know, there, there's not much. I guess the one thing would be, okay, does he really understand these transfer portal rules and, and could he get, uh, get that program in trouble? And the answer is probably no, because he's doing basically what everybody else is doing. So I think the risk is that on the field, maybe he's not a good coach um, at the Power 5 level. And – uh, when, when they have to make a decision, if he doesn't work out, he leaves them with a very talented roster that hasn't been co- coached up very well. It's a pretty good place to be. If, you're, if it doesn't work out and you still have a pretty talented roster, um, you know, you're, you're still set up. So the downside to me, I don't think there's really a, a downside uh, or at least a big downside. I think uh, the ceiling just got so much bigger. And like, like you said, 1-11, and 11, I mean – there's really nowhere else to go. You're not going to, I mean, if you go 0 and 12 at Colorado, um, you know, is that really any different than 1 and 11? No, not really. So, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very minimal risk in terms of where Colorado was. But, you know, if you're, if you're going to talk about what risk it is, it's that maybe he just doesn't understand how to coach in power five football. Speaking of the roster, he cleaned house when, when he got in. Um, how normal or not normal is that for a new coach entering a program? In this day and age, I think it's going to be more normal. I think for Dion, it was so interesting because he flat out said what he was going to do in his first team meeting. He, he said, I'm, some of you guys aren't going to be here. You're not going to want to play for me and I'm going to cut you. And luckily for, for Dion, um, the NCAA in this new era, you know, basically allows coaches to cut players in their first year. So you have the ability to make a massive roster overhaul like he did. Uh, so yeah, I wasn't surprised that 
we saw all of this movement. I think one thing that that really hurt him, which maybe was he didn't understand, was that okay, yeah, all these guys leave, but he thought there would be more of an attraction to him, and the roster could be built very quickly. I think what what the problem became is that all these kids that entered the transfer portal from other schools started hearing things like, oh, Alabama wants to talk to me. Oh, UCLA wants to talk to me. Oh, you know, all, all these other teams kind of jumped in. And so, yeah, maybe they were considering Colorado because we all know tampering happens. It's illegal, but it happens everywhere. But maybe they were destined for Colorado. But then once they actually entered the portal, they heard all these different things from different coaches around them and, and maybe Colorado wasn't so attractive. So I fully expected this to happen uh, in terms of the roster overhaul. He wants people to, he, he wants a specific group of people. He wants a specific type of player. And I think the NCAA obviously with its new rules allows that for first year coaches. But I think, and not just Dion, I think a lot of coaches around the country um, and I've talked to, to many of them, they, they didn't necessarily know, how these portal windows would work out, uh, the logistics, the amount of players who were in there, you know, how they enter and how they leave, when they leave, things like that. And so I think in retrospect, I don't think Dion did that right. And a lot of coaches didn't do it right. I don't think Nick Saban did it right uh, because I, did, I don't think that he realized that there were going to be so few players in the spring window. So I think that's the one thing that really Dion didn't have control over. And I think that is a problem it's not necessarily a huge problem because he's still got some dudes but it's gonna have it's gonna be hard for him to develop that depth uh knowing that really in the portal now or people that are in the portal now since the window is closed they're just kind of average to below average players yeah and one of those dudes that he has is his son shador um i always get I feel like you're you're always running a risk in a situation where you have someone where it's very hard to fire them, maybe even very hard to bench them uh, because it's it's not just a, a coach player relationship. It's a father son relationship. Um, am I am I overreacting to this? I mean, is this going to be fine because Shador is that good? And like, of course, they want him to be his QB. And um, or, or is there is there a volatile situation here? Well, I think first things first, they don't have anybody else. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, Shudder is a really good player. Um, Shudder is a really good player. Um, so the the likeliness of him being that bad uh, is not very likely. Uh, but, you know, I've been asked this question before, and I actually don't think it's a problem in the sense that I think Dion would actually be more prone to, to bench him if things don't go well, you know, as as his dad. because. I mean, I'm, I'm a dad of two kids. Like if they do something wrong, I want to make a statement. I want to make sure they understand the point that I'm trying to get through. So I think, you know, we always talk about nepotism in, in all kinds of life, you know, corporate, you know, life, you know, whatever. And I think in Dion's case, just kind of because of his personality, if things don't go well, he would probably bench him sooner than he probably should in order to set that tone as a father, not just a football coach. So um, but like I said, I mean, if, if Shadur plays so bad that he is even in consideration of being benched, then Colorado's in some big trouble because they don't have anybody else. And do you think the, the Sanders effect will have ripple effects outside of Colorado? Is, is this going to somehow affect the college football landscape in any way? I think there will be, if he succeeds, especially early, there will be more programs looking for that kind of edge, right? Like taking a little bit more risk. I mean, there's not going to be a personality out there like Dion, right? Like that's just, he's kind of his own entity. We've had Eddie George coach, um, I think it's Tennessee State. Um, maybe you do look to see, you know, more former stars who really don't have the experience as other coaches sort of step up and, and become, you know, real candidates uh, it just it's for Colorado. It's so specific to Dion, right? Like that's a much larger personality. But I, I think that in terms of of how ads look at candidates, there would definitely be, I think, a little bit more of a window open for creativity. And I think obviously that varies from school to school. But 
since it is kind of non-traditional for Colorado or for any Power Five school to dip down into FCS to HBCUs to whoever you know at a at a lower level and get a guy that is you know make him a Power Five coach right away. That's that's unorthodox, and so I, I do think that you would maybe see more risks being taken. Whereas in previous years, you know, if 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 an AD interviewed a coach and is like, oh, I like that guy, but let's wait, you know, four or five years and see how he does at the group of five level or whatever, you might not see that kind of attitude anymore. All right. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on this one. Barrett Salee, thanks so much for joining us on the show. My pleasure. That's it for today. Let us know what's on your mind at today at frontofficesports.com topics you want us to hit on, guests we should talk to, outlandish predictions in the sports world, we want it all. That's today at frontofficesports.com. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.